agenda? The agenda, okay. So as soon as I get them on here and I get live, then I'll go back and grab that. Will that be the corner where you are in that? Uh, I think it's going to actually be bigger than that on the screen, okay. I believe. Okay. I couldn't find the Zoom info, so I just thought I'd stop down. I'm sorry. Fantastic. How soon are you going to dive into? Uh, it'll be it'll be likely 20 minutes. Could you shoot me a text? Yeah. I'll stick my head down for that portion. Yeah. For the why camp? Yeah. Yeah. So Dick. Yeah. Run. Hey. I'm, I, yeah. It's oh, nice to meet you. You're Brian. Yes. Oh, good. Good to meet you too, man. It would be helpful if your name was Brian, then you really <laughs> There would be no confusion of the three top people, right? There you go. Like that. Yeah, I'll send you a text as soon as Silver Beach comes up, right? So we got to figure out how to do the fancy background. I'm sorry, do you want the thing? Brian, that's the. No, 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 I'll just walk oh, up. Okay, yeah, you can. So do they see us or do they see that? They can, I think that you guys can see both, correct? But that's oh. as big as they're going to be. They're going to be, that's, that's another reason why it's important for them to say who they are when they're speaking so that oh. we know who that is. If I wasn't sharing the screen, it wouldn't be that small. You can see them in the regular format. Okay, so you're live. You're ready to go. Okay, we call a meeting to order. Our approval of the minutes. Anybody have anything to add or subtract? Uh, uh, this is Carl. I move that uh, we approve the minutes. Okay, this is James Badner. This is James Badner. I second the motion. Okay. You got it, Phil? Yeah. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, all right. Uh, introduction of guests, Arda, communications. I um, have two communications for you at this time. Um, one could be underneath the Silver Beach subject, but I do want to let you know that um, we haven't met since, since January. Um, in April, our five-year plan Parks and Recreation Plan was approved by the DNR. And we did have the two grant applications submitted to the DNR that were administratively approved. One was for the um, acquisition of 35 acres at Madeline Bertrand, and one is to continue uh, phase two development at Paw Paw River County Park. During the course of the uh, grant reviews up in Lansing, one of the exciting things that happened to us was of the 150 or 200 applications that the DNR receives, uh, they chose 10 applicants around the state of Michigan. And we were one of the 10 to uh, give a presentation very similar to this, a Zoom presentation with uh, many of the DNR folks and, and, and whatnot. But um, Barry County Parks was one of 10 folks selected to make a presentation on the project to the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund. Does not mean that we'll get the grant, it just, I think it means recognition for Berrien County, Berrien County Parks, uh, the quality work that we do and the applications that we submit, the DNR knows that we do a good job. So I wanted to communicate that with you. Uh, the second bit of communication that has come to me is from Lighthouse, Point, and this could go under Silver Beach County Park, but back in January, you approved us to only remove trees that can cause um, uh, detriment to infrastructure or obviously human life, which we've done that. And Lighthouse Point is now, uh, we do have a couple of trees that are impacting one of their um, structures and we're going to remove those trees during that communication they've also asked for and, and uh you can see in the director's report but they've asked for some pine trees to be removed 
that are not impacting their building structurally, they're not impacting the uh, human life. Basically, they want the trees removed from their, for their view. And it is my opinion, um, I told the, the Board of Directors of Lighthouse Point that I would bring this to your attention, but we don't remove trees for people's view. Uh, we're a county park and, and uh, that's a slippery slope that I don't recommend you go down. And uh, if, I, if I can remind you, uh, a number of years back, we did remove a number of trees uh, that were facing to the west, and they specifically did not want the pine trees removed. And I think that was a wise move, and I think we should remain. They should remain there. I don't know if we want to have. Yeah, I don't know if we want to have. Go ahead. This is J.B. Hoyt. I certainly agree with, with Brian and Dick's point of view. I also agree. Ms. Carl. Okay, so I think we have a consensus that, that we will take down trees that are impacting infrastructure or could impact human, human life, but the trees that are there for, uh, that are basically doing their job, they're a tree in a park, they're going to remain. Got it. Okay, our uh, old business budget status report and report of collections. Well, it was a uh, uh, that hard. How huh? do you say it? It was a, a, a stressful time back in March, April, and May when we were shut down, and, and uh, Love Creek had full parking lots. Madeline Bertrand had off and on full parking lots when they were open. Um, and, uh, and then uh, what, what impact is this gonna have on our budget? And as, as we run the numbers, as Sue ran the numbers, um, the uh, uh, budgets have come in um, fairly good, at, particularly at Silver Beach, Love Creek, Madeline Bertrand. They're all down a little bit. But um, year over year, comparing 2019 to 2020, we are only down, and I want to say only, it's a substantial amount, but we're down $67,000 year over year or 10%. And considering that Silver Beach County Park, the, the largest revenue stream that we have had parking at 50% the entire summer, um, I think it's, it's uh, where we look like we're gonna land is in a good position. And Jill will show you some slides on parking comparatively from 2019 to 2020 at Silver Beach County Park. So the budget status report, um, all parks have collected $609,780. Um, the fee income is $609,780. Like I said, we're down $67,000. We still are going to collect a few payments. Uh, when I say substantial payments, um, the concession stand at Silver Beach had the best summer they've ever had, revenue-wise, sales-wise. We're gonna get a check from them for about $40,000, which is a little bit better than last year. Um, and I don't know if we've recorded the roughly uh, $12,000 that we're gonna get from the kayak business that happened last summer. Sorry. It's in there. It's in there, okay. So, but, uh, and then on our expense side of the house, parks were in an odd position because we were, uh, we were closed, but we were not closed. We still had folks using our facilities during the spring, um, but we didn't have any temporary staff on board. And instructions went out to parks to clamp down on spending wherever we could. We're rounding the third quarter of this, and we still have uh, roughly, um, we've used about 62% of our allotted um, income, which leaves about 38% as we're rounding the third Quarter. So I think we're going to end up 2020 in a, in a, in a fairly good position. OK, 
Chair, I entertain a motion to accept the budget staff report and the report of collections. You can move forward on the two slides now. I, I make a motion, Mamie Yarbrough. Maybe who else support? One more, two more. Who, who seconded? Who, who supported it? J.B. Hoyt. J.B. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Budget cat passed. Environmental programs update. One more. One more. Sorry. <laughs> One more. One more. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Joe, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. A quick update on the environmental and recycling programs. We also started out in an odd predicament. We had to cancel our first two events of the year. But as we uh, figured out how to socially distance and work out our events, we were able to hold three of our events, one in June, one in August, and one in September. And we have one event left. That event will take place on Saturday, October 10th at the landfill in Buchanan. We will be accepting hazardous waste, electronics, styrofoam, and we will also have document shredding services at this event. Oh, good. And, yes, um, very popular service for sure, the document shredding. And I think overall the, the events have been very successful. People have stayed in their vehicle. People have worn masks. We've been able to socially distance and they've gone very well. I do want to report on the Love Creek event in April or in August. We had an 80% increase in participation at this location. So nearly 400 people came through Love Creek's parking lot, dropped off materials at this event. And I feel very happy that maybe some of those people had never been out to Love Creek. And now they've been there, they've seen it, they've seen the lovely nature center and maybe they'll be back to um, go hiking at some point. So I have a very short video that shows the event at Love Creek. My fingers are crossed that it'll work. Is that the next screen, Jill? It is, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna give it a shot. Good. Yeah. So it's a little laggy, but you can kind of see we did have a nice lineup of vehicles. We had our vendors there on materials from car and um, most people, it was just a drive through service, which was what we were very much hoping for. We received thousands of pounds of electronics and thousands of pounds of household hazardous waste. We received so much foam, they filled, the foam truck got filled and they had to come back the next day and pick up a whole other truck full of foam because we collected more than we expected. Mm. Amazing. Go ahead, one more time. I'm sorry, I had you muted. Jill? Yes? Is this the first time we've collected foam? We typically collect foam one time a year in April and that event was canceled this year. So with, with some funding and a new partner we found out of Elkhart, we were able to add foam to the, the final four events that we hold this year. And people have been very happy about that. So that was the, the video. It um, is actually set to music and it's um, pretty nice to kind of just show it's how easy it is to come out and recycle at one of these events. Okay, thank you, Silver Beach Report. Um, would, you, would, you, uh, would you hold on a minute? May I ask something? 
Chairman, ahead, uh, Mimi Yarbrough. Jill, where is this Buchanan? What, what is the street or something? Help me, because I'm always lost. Just, just give me an, give me an address. Sure. Um, the the October 10th event will take place at the Southeast Berrien County Landfill. The address is 3200 Chamberlain Road. It's a Buchanan address. Okay. Thank you. Question. Yes. Um, for the people like Mamie and myself who are bringing documents to be shredded, how do you want those packaged? Great question. Uh, we need to make sure that people take out any kind of metal or plastic materials. If you have CDs in there or checkbook covers, those need to be taken out. Otherwise, um, checkbooks and folders and any type of paper material, including staples, are fine to keep in there. Oh. Um, something easy to dump the documents. The, the documents will be dumped into a rolling cart. So. If you've got it, if you've got all your documents in a plastic tote, those would be dumped into a cart and that cart then is lifted up onto the truck, dumped in the truck and shredded right there on site. So something, maybe small quantities, easy to handle and dump into another container. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Silver Beach. Okay, um, Annette, if you want to go to the next slide. This slide shows the number of vehicles parked at Silver Beach over the, the four months that we were allowed to park vehicles at Silver Beach and count them. Um, July, last year in July, we saw a larger number of cars parked, but all the other months show showcase that we parked more vehicles this year than we did last year. And considering that we were only allowed to fill our parking lot to half full, that's pretty impressive. We were busy, I would say every single day, seven days a week, we had a really very decent crowd come out to the beach and enjoy it. I think it's due to the fact that we were able to be open and many other recreational facilities around the state maybe weren't. So parks really saw an influx and an increase in visitors. Next slide. This slide showcases the Sheriff's Department reports from the summer. They were on site for 52 days total and they were very active. I saw them talking to many people. Many people would come up to them and ask them questions. Uh, it's a fantastic partnership we have with the Sheriff's Department to have them on site most Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays throughout the summer. So you can see that they did write some citations, mostly alcohol was the big one. Um, so they're keeping their eye out. The Rangers are also going around the park and um, educating people about dogs on the, on the beach and no alcohol, no glass rules. Uh, so that kind of gives the overview of how the summer went with the Sheriff's Department. Next. Brian. Uh, we did have uh, uh, maybe 10 days ago, two weeks ago, um, graffiti occurred on the Army Corps of Engineers uh, South Pier that adjoins Silver Beach County Park. Uh, it happened on a Friday evening. Um, Jill uh, reported to work Saturday morning, noticed some graffiti, and then um, uh, a, 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 one of the, a member of the public notified her of the immense amount of graffiti that was on the pier. Law enforcement was notified. We were notified. We notified uh, County Administrator set And Army Corps was obviously involved and uh, the solution came as far as because of the sense of environment and the timeliness, Army Corps recommended that, that, uh, that we paint that. And uh, uh, so we, Barry County Park staff went down there last week, I believe, um, last Thursday, 
and immediately painted over after the board of commissioners approved um, us moving forward with that proposal from the Army Corps. So there's a before picture, and then that, you just bump the next slide. Um, and uh, there's the after. So uh, uh, we took care of the graffiti and, and we'll continue to monitor that, and, and uh, hopefully it doesn't happen again. We get the video camera fixed for future uh, incidents. Our, infra, our IT department has uh, diagnosed the camera, um, working on getting a new camera commissioner, and uh, they're in contact with the sheriff's department as far as what is the best camera as far as zoom and tilt and, and night features, so on and so forth. So it is on a fast track to get replaced. Um, may I ask a right out the carte, carte blanche agreement with the board to do this as needed? I, I did reach out to them, Commissioner, as far as is this the protocol for the future? As far as can we coordinate with county staff to paint this? And the answer is yes. So, whether we use volunteers, sure. county parks, county Whoever's available at the quickest response will would uh, take care of that. We get vandalized with graffiti three to five times at Silver Beach County Park, typically a summer or in, in a year, um, and it's very it's, it's almost desk or or it's not typically it's not very large areas. And we can immediately remove these things with chemical solvents, typically. This was a very large, expansive area surrounded by Lake Michigan water. So it's it a sensitive uh, remediation. But yes, to answer your question, that's the protocol for the pier. Mamie Yarbrough, I have a question. We haven't talked about it in a while, but are those life rings there and the all the you know all the things we went through are they there are they connected up uh, is the camera on those could you tell us a little bit about that life rings are in place um the, the they as far as i know the sheriff's department inspects the life rings and i'm not aware jill you might have a better answer but i'm not aware of much if any vandalism to the life rings this summer um and to, to the camera it will do two things for us, monitor the life rings and also monitor um, crime on the pier. Okay. Do you know anything, Jill, about it? Uh, yes, it's it's been a good summer as far as the life rings go. I have not had any report of, of, of those going missing very often. We've had to replace one or two on the lifeguard towers, which we have an extra stash available in our beach office. Okay. Um, so we, we do have some on standby in case one gets lost or tossed or whatever the case might be. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, uh, this slide just shows that season wrap up is upon us and we've been putting up some snow fence. We've taken out the swim buoys taken down the flags, all the regular September tasks that we do to sort of start wrapping up the end of summer season. We've had a, just a wonderful group, number of groups of volunteers come out and help with this final cleanup and litter pickup throughout the summer. So the park is looking very good and we will continue uh, putting things away and buttoning things up as we get into the colder months. Next. You know, uh, back in August, uh, we sent you, I believe it was three proposals um, on the Silver Beach erosion at the very south end of the park where uh, the corner of Park Street and, and Lake Street. And the, uh, there is concern, obviously, the, the uh, uh, shade shelter there is compromised, as you can see. 
The sidewalk is intact. It's buffered by concrete that was placed there by the city back in either the 70s or 80s. Um, but there is concern for both the sidewalk, the, the shade structure, and most importantly, the road. And Brian Desette and I have been in contact with the Army Corps of Engineers, um, in contact with the consultants. And I think one of the best solutions we have right now has come from Edgewater, from Greg Wycamp. And, and then if you move to the next slide. Um, you know, weather is against us right now. And if we can get some type of a temporary solution to get us through the spring of 2021 so that we can develop a plan or infrastructure that will be here for another 30 to 40 years, we'll, we'll work with Greg Wycamp and Edgewater on this plan to put in something similar, similar to these HESCO barriers um, that were designed and used by the military. They're used in other flooding situations and erosion situations as a temporary measure. And if this board approves of us uh, moving forward in this direction, that's what we'll do on an emergency basis with the Berrien County Board of Commissioners. Mr. Chair, can I, uh, can I chime in? Sure, sure. Uh, city group names, uh, Brian Desette. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just tell we are, okay. Sorry. My name is Brian Desette. I, I've met several of you. Uh, the image that you're looking at um, is from South Haven's wastewater treatment plant. Um, the boxes are called HESCO barriers. Uh, the HESCO product is supplied to South Haven by the Army Corps of Engineers. And um, I worked actively on this agreement. The HESCO barriers are used for, for flood control. They're also used actively by the military for a variety of purposes, even to, to construct a temporary bases. It's a pretty robust product and it's also a simple product. It's essentially um, a steel cage with uh, a fabric liner and then you just set it up and begin filling with sand. This is something that we could have in place yet this year. It's something that would be relatively low cost. Um, the downside to it is it is labor intensive. We will need some help either from our buildings and grounds department or possibly an outside contractor. Additionally, this is something that just be prepared. You may get some complaints that it's not the prettiest solution. It's a solution that you could have in place for one to two years while you determine what is the long-term solution. I think that as Brian and I have gone back and forth on a dozen different options, we both started with HESCO and I think we concluded with HESCO that this is probably our best bet for getting something in place that can be placed yet this calendar year will be robust enough to provide a, a degree of protection to the county's property as well as the city of St. Joe Street and um, is a tried and true product. Um, the proposal that you're looking at from Edgewater from essentially from start to finish for less than $19,000, they can help us with the design, they can help us with the permitting they can help us with the on-site construction. And the thing that I would just stress to this group is, neither myself nor Brian, we just don't have the expertise to work with the Army Corps to get this thing set up, to get it permitted, and to get it built. We need some outside assistance. Um, I know that Commissioner Chickering has been very clear that he has reminded me a couple of times that winter is coming fast, the storms are coming, and we need to get something in place. I think this is probably our best option for the time being, and it does buy us time to have a more robust conversation about what do you want a long-term solution to look like, how are we going to pay for it, and when to get it built. That was a lot of information that I tried to condense down to less than a couple of minutes. I'll happily respond to any questions. Uh, this is JB with a question for either of the Bryans. Um, obviously, the, the the city has a vested interest in this and protecting their road. Where are we in terms of negotiations with the city on some sort of cost sharing? You want me to say that? Sure. All 
All right, so this is Brian Set. Um, I've had a number of conversations with the city manager for the city of St. Joe, uh, John Hodgson. Uh, John has visited the site uh, once with me, possibly a couple of times. Uh, John has indicated that the city has vested interest, has a willingness to assist. We have not yet reached a dollar figure as to what the city is willing to do. Put simply, the city is looking for us to figure out what we're willing to place, figure out what the total project's going to be, and then I should be able to get a number out of them. Um, I believe that they're willing to help with the temporary. I believe they're also willing to look at a long-term solution. Maybe the next slide, in there. Yeah, so again, this is Brian. This is, this is the word of caution I'm offering to all of you. This is a pretty scenic location, and I think that this is a good solution. I think that it, it's the quickest way to protect the road, but I guarantee you, some of you will get complaints that as people drive this, this stretch of road, that their views are going to be potentially impaired. I think it's a relatively minor complaint, but I also want to make sure that you go into this with eyes open. Uh, did you, would these be in the water? Yeah, there was well, water. that that is really going to be a question for the consultant. As I worked with the Army Corps of Engineers, they made clear that they needed a flat surface for these to be effective. And I don't know how you place these in the water right now and guarantee that there's a flat surface. I'm guessing that we're looking at either some type of site excavation to remove some riprap to place them below the sidewalk or possibly placing them on the sidewalk. But without getting an engineering firm that specializes in this engaged, I just don't know how we can answer that with a degree of confidence. Great, thank you. Yep. What, I, this we, is Jim, James Spadner. What was the fee for this again? So if we go through all five steps um, that are listed out in the uh, in uh, the Edgewater proposal, it's eighteen thousand eight hundred dollars. And in speaking with Mr. Whitecamp, there's a chance that we could knock down some of that number. But I guarantee this group, if we were going to place something down there, we have to go through the joint permitting process. And that will require outside assistance. The, the kicker here again, um, I guess my recommendation to the board is that we go ahead with the temporary because that's what, one, it's going to protect us, and two, it's going to give us time over the next year or two to decide on a long term project that will last us for a long, long time. And I think over time it will be less expensive. So I guess my recommendation is to have a motion to proceed with this project. Well, I would like to, I have a question. Is it when that sand washes out of the top, do they do they just keep putting more back in the top? Who's talking? Yeah. Who's talking? This is Christopher Quatrin. Okay, thank you. All right, sorry, Commissioner Yarborough. Um when the when it washes off out of the top, do they just keep filling that with sand? Is that what they do? Yeah, so in South Haven, we've had these up for probably three to four months. Um, they are placed all within flooded areas. We had, a, to the best of my knowledge, before I left South Haven, we were not losing any sand. But it's a pretty simple process to just get down there with, uh, with a loader. If you've got a significant amount of sand that you're losing, a loader could do it. If it's a minor amount, it's probably just a couple of, of workers that can refill we're it. Where are they using them in South Haven, along the river or along the uh, the beach, the Lake Michigan? The answer is yes. Um, <laughs> they're using them along uh, the Dunkley Avenue corridor. There was significant flooding from the river into the wastewater treatment plant. They are also using them on wells on the other side of the wastewater treatment plant. They're using them on uh, another section of, of Dunkley Ave, and they're using them at uh, the South Beach um, trying to armor the area around the, the water filtration plant. So they're they're all over the place. Would, excuse me, Mamie Yadro, would you spell that for us? Ma'am, can you clarify? 
Alec, heckle, heckle, heck, what? It, it, yeah, it's, it's a HESCO style barrier, H-E-S-C-O. Thank you. No problem. Brian, question? Which Ryan? Are we going to have a discussion? Are we going to have a discussion about this tomorrow morning at the commission? Uh, Commissioner Chickering, I think it would be a good idea to, uh, if you are comfortable, I am more than comfortable asking the board to amend their, their standard practice and to accelerate, um, accelerate this process. All we're talking about today is engaging Edgewater um, for a total amount of $18,800. Uh, the HESCO barriers are, will have to be ordered through the Army Corps. That will be done as an interlocal agreement between Darien County and the Army Corps. But we really can't get that order rolling until we, we have started on the design and on the permitting process. Very yeah. good. Is this Edgewater's recommendation for these cells, or is it something we're taking to them saying, hey, can you design this to work? So we discussed this briefly with uh, the owner of Edgewater, uh, Greg Weikamp, yesterday. Um, Greg is very familiar with the use of, of the HESCO barrier. He's also familiar with the cooperation with the Army Corps. So to answer your question, is it their recommendation? No, but in consulting with them, I believe that there was general agreement that this made sense as a temporary measure. The, the reason this will make sense is the Army Corps has the ability to quickly supply this material to Berrien County. Um, it's a relatively simple process to go through the requisition to the Army Corps. This gets a little deep into the weeds, but as you work with the Army Corps, if there is a, a disaster declaration that, which comes from the state of Michigan, the Army Corps then has the ability to eliminate any costs associated with their assistance. Um, so that's further down the road, but that's why working with the Army Corps makes so much sense. They can provide you the materials quickly, and then they can work with you to seek the, uh, the disaster rep declaration, which then eliminates any costs that would be associated with it. We can go to third party private providers and buy similar materials, but you're going to immediately uh, be paying uh, the retail costs, uh, whatever whatever vendor you go with. And you're talking temporary. What's the idea of temporary? Is that a month, two months, two years, three years? Uh, again, not to, to, to sound cute, but the answer is yes. It, it could be as little as six months, it could be as long as five years. Um, it's going to be determined by number one, lake levels, and number two, by county leadership deciding what is their vision for, for this area. And if the vision for the area between uh, the Board of Commissioners and the Parks Commission is just to allow the riprap that's in place to stay, um, then you don't have to do much. If there is a desire to pursue um, a more grand rollout of uh, erosion control that includes seat walls and ADA access, well, that could take quite a bit of time to go through the process. So you could spend a couple of years in design, a couple of years in grant seeking. It could be a while. But what I know is if you do nothing today as the the storms come in this winter there is a growing probability that you will lose sidewalk after you lose sidewalk there's a growing probability that you will lose street this is jb hoyt i move that we uh authorize brian bailey and brian Desette to continue to move forward with this uh with the proposal from edgewater uh as promptly as possible and continue to pursue a long range solution which fits the nature of the situation, recognizing that what lake levels will continue to rise and fall, but that a permanent solution is, is something that should be sought. I, I second this is Christopher Quach, and I second the motion to go ahead and engage Edgewater to come up with a design. Uh, 
is for this. Uh, this is Carl in a discussion. Uh, is there a possibility there's grant money that we can get to help supplement our expenses? I'm not aware. Yeah. So the answer is potentially. Um, at this moment, I'm not aware of any funding that we could be going after to pay for the design services. Um, next week, maybe two weeks, uh, the state is hosting uh, an updated webinar on uh, potential funding sources for shoreline erosion. Um, I've told this story a couple of times to, to the media, a couple of times to elected officials, but the day of the governor's announcement back in March uh, to close schools, that day I was hosting a sit down lunch with uh, Senator Nesbitt and uh, his team from uh, the state of Michigan. We were reviewing the state's budget proposal. The, the governor's budget proposal had 40 million allocated for shoreline erosion. The legislature's counter proposal had up to 5 million allocated for shoreline erosion. The day that the COVID-19 school closure announcement came from the governor's office, all of that changed. Instantly, we knew that any of the funds for shoreline erosion were likely off the table as the state of Michigan began pivoting towards dealing with the pandemic. As of today, the legislature has pushed forth a uh, counter proposal to the governor's budget, which is limited to just $250 million worth of cuts. I have not yet had a chance to review if there will be any shoreline erosion dollars within the budget, but that's something that we'll actively do. But to answer your question, Commissioner, six months ago, yes, there was likely dollars available to pay for this. Fast forward to today, it's just a very different picture. The answer is there could be, but at this moment, I don't know. Okay, second question. At this point, we're gonna go along with our plan, uh, regardless of St. Joe's uh, options to join or not join? The, the intent is today to get the design services approved. That is the first step. We still have to go through the design and permitting and then the negotiation with the Army Corps to, uh, to receive this type of material. As that total cost is determined, I will absolutely continue communication with the City of St. Joe. But my recommendation to the Board of Commissioners is going to be, this is county property and it makes sense to protect it if we can offset some of our costs for partnering with the city of St. Joe, that's great. But at its core, this is county property. We need to take some steps. Thank you. I think one of the interesting things is going to be, this, this, this is Christopher Quark. I think one of the interesting things is people are armoring their beaches down, up and down with the stone when the, when the water does recede but they're going to have the stone beaches. They're not going to have the beautiful brown stand that southwestern Michigan is known for anymore. I guess some of it may be re re you know, with the uh, the movement of the sand, you know, from the lake back to the beaches. But I think um, we, we probably want to be cognitive of that, of any type of permanent type of structures we put out there that, you know, we may be permanently changing, you know, how that beach will be able to be used. Dick Schickel here. For, that's one of the reasons that this temporary fix will give us time to decide what the long-term future is. And I agree, we need to have that sand back there to have a pristine beach, but it can be done, but not doing it hastily. May, may I say something? Mamie Yarbrough? Uh, yes, I mean. in, the United, in the federal government, and uh, Fred Upton and um, Congresswoman Stabenow are on this committee, maybe chairing it for money to come to uh, beaches for erosion and all. There was a whole lot of money from the freight or the concrete, you know, those people that bring things in. There is a budget in Washington, D.C. that. Yeah.
I guess we just have to kind of wait and see what, what comes about. Uh, this, this is J.B. Hoyt. Uh, uh, Christopher, I appreciate your point on, on what happens when the, sand, when the water level recedes and how much it recedes. Uh, I've been involved in extensive discussions on this with experts at Michigan Tech. Uh, we've shown multiple examples where if the water recedes, it will re the beach will be renourished and the sand will materialize if the water goes down far enough. I mean, witness the fact we've got riprap there that many of us didn't even know existed. We had sand outside of that for, uh, for a number of years. Great, thank you. Is there anybody who seconded the motion? Who did? Who was seconded? Okay. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. Okay. We'll do a roll call. We have to do a roll call vote. Okay, roll call, please. Okay. Dick Schenkel? Yes. Katie Hoyt? Hey. Carl Keeper? Yes. Mamie Yarborough? We lost Mamie. She's not that guy yet. Okay. Christopher Quatran? Yes. Bill Chickering? Yes. Tony Corkin? He's on here, but he's muted. Tony Corgan. He's trying. James Bednar. Yes. I didn't get to hear the motion either, but I said yes. But what's the motion? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Mr. Chairman, can you hear Tony? Oh, Tony's, uh, yeah, Tony's Tony. 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 Mr. Chairman, can you can hear Tony? Tony. Is that all? Yes, we can hear you, Tony. Okay. So, so did you want to vote on the motion? I said yes on that last motion. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, my motion is passed. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, there's that Thanks. It's fine. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, next. Well, just to give you. At the beginning of our conversation, we've discussed the trees, and unfortunately, it's these popular trees that are impacting a, um, a, 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 a fence that's a, uh, made out of uh, decorative stone that surrounds their pool, and it, it certainly is impacting their, their property, and so those trees um, are going to be removed. Okay. Next slide, Matt. Ryan, one question. Question. Yes. Were those trees there before the pool? Yes. And I assume that the interference that's happening is the roots of the tree are impacting the subsequently constructed pool? Right, Commissioner. They brought me inside the property. The trees. Um, I don't really know how old they are, but as you, as I went inside the property, the, you can see that the retaining wall is is, uh, is starting to be compromised. And uh, the tr tree consultant that we had come down, that we've been working with county parks, uh, county, they work all over uh, Fort Bearing County, said, yeah, these trees uh, uh, are impacting. One possible option is, that came from the tree consultant was to go in and cut the roots of the tree, but he didn't know how long that would last as far as 
the because the root system is so entwined on those three poplar trees and, and impacting that that uh, retaining wall, but that was a consideration. I took it upon myself once I saw that the property was being damaged that yes, those trees probably should come down. Okay. It's too bad they were there first. <laughs> yes, and they are very large trees. Hey, Brian. That, ha that, ha that happened. <laughs> that Brian, what kind of foreseeable? Just Tony trying to talk. Go ahead, Tony. What kind of trees are those? They're poplars. Poplar? Okay. Yes. Yes. And they're they're a substantial size to them. Okay, thank you. Derek from Love Creek, are you on board with us over telephone? Can you hear me? Hi, Derek. This yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. All right. Um, we're just uh, just to kind of come back around to uh, you know spring before everything went down. Um, we did have a, a nice lineup of, of, of different events and different programs, a few things that, that uh, really haven't been done here before, you know, including uh, a whole pollinator series that we were going to have a few guest speakers on and, and pairing up on a few events with the Bering Conservation District. So I'm hoping that uh, we can come back around to those things this next spring since we've made these contacts and, and made these connections and hopefully we can, we can set up some nice things uh, like we had set up. Uh, this spring for next spring. Uh, next slide. Can you still, next slide. Um, <clears throat> I think I counted the number of days um, from start to finish, including the, the days we're normally closing. It was like, uh, somewhere around 72 days. Um, but, but during the weekends, um, especially on some of these sunny days, you know, we saw crowds of people that, that that packed nearly our entire parking lot that looked uh, uh, something similar to a, a really good ski weekend. Um, so I think uh, providing the opportunity for our trails to be open for people still to come out and enjoy um, nature had a strong benefit for our park and parks in general, um, especially to see so many people out. And not only that, but after we did open, um, we've had numerous people come in and, and thank us for the fact that, that uh, these trails, not only at Love Creek, but um, the other parks as well that they were open and, and, and people had places to go and, and relieve some stress and get outside. Um, so we continue, you know, we were here and, uh, a lot of the time and continue to take care of the trails and make sure that they were safe, um, um, especially the bike trail. We had a lot of bikers out. As you know, bikes are pretty much sold out everywhere and I think they're finally just starting to rebound. So it was nice to see um, so many people out. Um, and then a large portion of the time starting in early spring, we, we, we really hit it hard on invasive species and not just invasive species, but um, um, some, some restoration projects in our main prairie. Um, the top two pictures um, kind of depict, it's, it's fall, so they haven't bloomed out yet, but these are, just, these are just brambles. And although they are native, they're most likely a hybrid bramble, but it'll just take over the prairie and you can't even move, almost critters can't even move through it. Um, so we've worked a lot on getting that. And this is the place where we, where we do our woodcock walk. So it's important, it's important to keep these areas um, you know, more natural, um, like a prairie, so that we can continue to do things like, like uh, prairie walks. Um, it's also important to eastern box turtles um, and uh, blue racers and things of that nature. Um, so we also worked on uh, not only at Love Creek, but at uh, um, Pawpaw River, some invasive species action. Um, uh, the newest, the newest property, the, the Higgins property that we acquired here at Love Creek, um, has a, a few stands of uh, Phragmites and Japanese knotweed um, that we're looking, that we started treatments on, and hopefully eradicate within the next two years, um, so that uh, it doesn't encroach on that uh, wetland that's back there. 
Um, lots of lots of hand pulling with garlic mustard also continued, so we were able to get make make significant dents in that um, with with the added time. <clears throat> um, next slide. Oh yeah. So here's here's just some bags of garlic mustard. Um, another big project. Um, we also had a volunteer help us with Jim Arwell, who lives in the. Uh, the development um, behind Love Creek, uh, uh, Love Creek Valley Loop. Um, the trail there was um, eliminating a lot of honeysuckle. I know you can't see it probably in these little pictures here, but um, along the Marsh Trail, we were able to cut back invasive non-native honeysuckle in a large area of that property, uh, a large area of that location um, to help stimulate more growth of native vegetation, especially the spring wildflowers that, 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 that Love Creek is, is known for during the spring. So we we're happy to have that help and um, take care of, uh, of a lot of that honeysuckle. Um, next slide. Uh, coming back around to the, it's almost been in November, it'll be a year now since uh, um, we did the fall burn at the Indian Bowl property. And I'm happy to report that some areas um, seemed to look really good, even though it was a fall burn, so it wasn't as intense. Uh, bottom right picture kind of shows um, a little bit of what a fen uh, more historically looks like. And so um, even though I plan to hopefully take another trip or two this, this fall to see what else is still sprouting up, you can see that we've had, that, I, that I've located a lot of threatened species, not only plant, but also animal. Um, you know, the queen of prairie, purple milkweed, blue flag iris, Dollars toad, pickle frog, and, and a lot of box turtles. And, and, and like we talked about when, when we're restoring prairies and even fence, if, if the woody vegetation continues to grow and outcompete a lot of these lower, lower lying plants, you know, animals and plants like these just get shaded out and pushed out and then they don't occur in that area anymore. So it was good to see um, a lot of activity there and, and uh, I'm hopeful for the, for the future. Uh, we continue to uh, practice good stewardship on that property. <laughs> Derek? Yeah. Are those pictures from the, uh, the Fen? Yeah, these are pictures I took uh, throughout uh, late spring, um, early summer. Okay, what you might do to help with uh, uh, very, very talented board is make a presentation and show them what can happen when you do a burn. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm hoping to I'll collaborate a few more of my pictures. And uh, uh, when we read when we revisit this, hopefully in the near future that uh, um, I'm hoping they'll be more likely to, uh, you know, accept restoration and stewardship on that property. So absolutely. Um, Thank you. All right. Yep. Thanks. Uh, next slide. Um, spring, obviously, uh, as, even as far as the programs go, we, we still didn't have any, um, you know, spring school programs. Um, we started doing a few here and there um, for the fall, late summer, early fall. Um, uh, Lamanda has um, been doing well um, with our homeschool program, which we've had two classes already. Um, we're practicing all the guidelines and, and staying outside and doing everything we can um, with the current mandates that are in place. Um, we've also seen, <clears throat> uh, we had a mountain bike clinic out here um, a few weeks ago, which had really good reception uh, between adults and kids alike. Um, uh, so it was good to get uh, one of those started as well. Um, all right, next page, next slide. <clears throat> um, so some of the other fall things we just started was, you know, bird, burying bird club out, bird outings, um, doing one or two a week um, with a limit that people have to register for, um, and that's going well uh, so far. Um, our new uh, temporary naturalist started August 12th to replace Teresa Peterson, her name's Bailey, um, and she's been doing very well and fitting in nicely, so we're happy to have her um, on staff here. 
Um, and then I'm looking to uh, uh, the my deer hunt uh, permits were approved for 15 tags, and I'm uh, I'm looking at having the dates in front of you: the 15th, 21st, 22nd, 26th, 20th, 29th. Uh, these are proposed dates. Um, I think uh, fits best with our schedule and for the hunters themselves. So I'm looking for some feedback um, on that. Um, if that all looks good to everybody. Looks great. I hope they get a lot of them. <laughs> um, with uh, some of the donations we had uh, last year between Bitzer and Bike Michiana Coalition, we were able to make some quotes on um, some new ski, new ski equipment, um, which should be taken care of. We went with Alpina skis um, and had a really nice quote um, and look forward to, to getting some new equipment for everybody coming out. And hopefully we just actually get some snow this year would, uh, would be great and can allow people to come inside and rent equipment. Um, it does not look like uh, Outpost Sports is going to supply fat bikes this year, so we're potentially exploring options for the future. Um, we will continue to group for fat bikes, however. Uh, and that's, uh, that's all I have. Great, thank you. Any questions for Derek? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Marilyn Bertrand. Jay or Derek, are you able to tune in? Well, I'll, I'll give a brief update. Can, they can hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, most of the reservations at Marilyn Bertrand, as far as the family reunions and uh, any company picnics, were. Uh, were canceled because most of them were indoors in the Bertrand Lodge. But the park was busy. Um, they did have a number of disc golfers out there. They had a number of hikers and walkers. And uh, they are proceeding with the deer hunt as well for November. Uh, applications went into the DNR. Um, and all in all, Madeline Bertrand had a fairly, uh, fairly good summer um, is what I'll report on that. Um, any questions regarding that park? Colleen River. Uh, just an FYI, um, a reporter from WNDU contacted me last week, and uh, there will be a feature uh, story about uh, Colleen River County Park on WNDU television uh, starting Saturday. I don't know uh, how long the feature will be, or what if it will be on the news, or it will be uh, a separate broadcast, but. Uh, your park, Colleen River County Park, will be featured on WNDU. And uh, when I was out there with the reporter, um, he was able to capture, and I was able to capture, a, a very nice scene of three generations. And it's the next slide in that. Uh, a family of three generations was out using the park, and a uh, special note uh, of all abilities. So I thought that was uh, very cool, and it probably will be on the WNDU segment. So. Uh, if we find it, then we'll, we'll share it with you um, somehow. So. Okay, historic record house. That's all right. I don't think Ree is with us right now, but uh, the 1839 courthouse did get a substantial improvement this year with new windows, new paint. And I'm working with uh, Buildings Grounds, Todd Johnson, on electrical concerns at that property now. Um, how do we upgrade the electric out there? And uh, uh, his second in command, Robert Ray, said, Brian, you've got a build beautiful building there now. We need to get it lit up at night. So we're working um, on the electrical side of the house for that building. Uh, but the building has got new windows and it is painted and she re continues to do uh, an outstanding job uh, on the inside of the building. Um, as she was just working on the old display cases, we found some asbestos that set us back for a little bit time wise, um, but we didn't take care of that. So um, that property um, 
is moving forward as well. Any questions with that? The uh, the windows have made a big difference in, because they're thermal in the, the heating and cooling of the building. Uh, and they are very, very, well, basically people driving by can't tell them from the old type windows. So we did a good job with that and the painting was magnificent. Okay, Roger Gap. Joe, you want to report on the rentals? Uh, sure. We had a quite a few rentals at the Rocky Gap Overlook Deck, the Lake Michigan Overlook Deck. Beautiful location for a party or a wedding. We had 17 rentals this year, which um, being all outside made it pretty easy to have a small gathering there without breaking any rules. I believe in 2019, we may have had about 19 rentals at Rocky Gap. So we're right in the same ballpark as last year. Next slide. Then. We do have some concern with erosion and that piece of cement that you see there, um, as the, the ramp leading down from the parking lot to the beach was constructed, uh, we had uh, erosion coming in from the street. Uh, if you recall, this was done in 2016. Uh, since then, uh, uh, the Barry County Road Department has redone Rocky Gap, and we don't have any more erosion, Rocky Gap Road, and we don't have the erosion coming in from the uh, uh, road that we used to. But our maintenance folks were able to go up there and, and stabilize. Now that piece of structure is a drain um, that was put in uh, by the uh, architects and engineers to, to control that water. But next slide in that. And this picture is taken from inside of our tractor. That's why it looks a little bit gory, but they were able to, to um, shore up that cement with um, sand. We did have a good amount of vegetation grow this summer along the Rocky Gap ramp. So I think uh, the groins that are out there, if you recall, there's, there's a number of six or seven groins that are out uh, into the lake at that location. So some of those things are doing what they were designed to do and capture some of the sand. I think we have a little bit more beach there now than we did in the spring. We all know that with Lake Michigan that can change very quickly, but we're monitoring the, the, the uh, erosion at Rocky Gap and it, it's not nearly as bad as what we're dealing with at, at uh, uh, Silver Beach with the sidewalk, the shade shelter, and the road. So, um, any questions? Yes, uh, maybe Yarbrough. I'd like to ask you about, I'd like to ask you about Rocky Gap. You know, you talked about that fence. It's kind of between from the outlook towards Rocky Gap. I started noticing it. Is that anything you mean to work on? Maybe that's, that's uh, it may, I'd have to look at our five year plan. Uh, obviously it's an eyesore. Um, there is, uh, it's something that I would like to see done, and maybe he's talking about the chain link fence five foot tall that goes from the lower portion of Rocky Gap to the upper portion. Um, that was installed back in the late 80s when we took over the park. There was a lot of um, minor crime that was happening at the park. And uh, since we're maintaining it for their daily, um, crime there is really diminished as far as vandalism. Uh -huh. um, but it's just an eyesore that I would like to see eliminated. However, um, it's probably a $10,000 project um, that is a luxury at this time due to budgets. Okay. And, and but would people fall? Is, would it be dangerous that they'd fall off, off there without something? I don't think so. That? I don't think so, Commissioner. The, the city of St. Joe has also removed some fencing at their Overlook Parks on, on Lakeshore Drive, and they put signs up 
Um, and what we see at our other parks is people try to take, or they do take the path of least resistance. Okay. And there is, and we would sign that. I know that there is some poison ivy in there. I know that there are some, it's a, it's a uh, tick habitat. And okay. I, don't think people, I don't think people want to go through that. All right. So, so. <laughs> okay. But That's again, it's, it's, it, it's just something that we, if funding becomes available, it's something this board would have to vote on. Is this a priority to remove this fence? It's, it's a visual uh, negative impact of Lake Michigan. The Palm Park River. Just a quick reminder on Palm Park River. Next slide. Sorry, I just made me out that she's frozen again. Okay. Okay. We did. Uh, we are working right now to acquire the 63 acres that's outlined in the in the light blue area. The triangle that's on the left there is basically the outline of our current county park. Um, <laughs> Hello? Okay. Uh, but really continuing the same theme, the grant application is in the DNR. Um, we'll get a thumbs up or a thumbs down on that grant application in December. And then funding, um, we wouldn't start construction on this until spring of 2022. We wouldn't get a, a, an approval from the DNR as far as a contract from them until probably July of 2021. And then we would hire a consultant to come up with the uh, uh, design, engineering, construction drawings. And by the time we bid that project, we would be into October and November of a year from now. And so due to timelines and budgets, if we get the grant, your construction would be recommended for spring of 2022. So again, going back to uh, some grants are a lengthy process, and we all know that, but the rewards are, are, are invaluable with our, with our projects. So any questions with this? Oh, next slide. There's the, the property that we're, uh, I'm working to acquire this. I hope to have the property acquired uh, by November 1st. And that's a grant funded project as well. Next slide. Is there any budget? 2021 budget. Did you want to next. get the fees on changing? It's going to the, it went out to your board and they approved it. So okay. it's going to the park. Uh, folks, real quick, the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund, uh, not just burying county parks, but the municipalities that there's been 53 grants that have come to different municipalities in Berrien County. Over $21 million has come into Berrien County, meaning City of Nile, City of New Buffalo, City of Bent Harbor, Berrien County Parks. Um, a substantial amount of that has come into Berrien County Parks. When you go to vote in November, or if you're doing your uh, your mailing ballot, you're going to see proposal one is to change the funding distribution of the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund. Right now, it's a 50-50 split between 50% goes to acquisition, 50% goes to development. Next slide on that. And what that proposal is, is coming to you for, for a vote is that a minimum of 25% would be spent on acquisition. The remaining would be split basically how they see fit, how the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund Board sees, do we want to take, you know, a minimum of 25% is going to be purchase, purchasing property but the other 75%, what are we going to do with that? How does that happen? How do they, they want to be able to, really what they want to do is go, they realize some of their infrastructure projects are nearly 30 or 40 years old and at the end of their life. Maybe we need to take some of those dollars away from acquisition and put it towards infrastructure. The other 
important component is right now revenue from oil and gas extraction in Michigan is going into the State Parks Endowment Fund. When that fund reaches its cap, what Proposal 1 does is says, okay, any more extraction of oil and gas, once the State Parks Endowment Fund reaches a cap, those dollars are going to go back into the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund. So that is, these dollars are constitutionally protected and that's why it is going to the voters as far as um, this proposal. The Michigan Recreation Park Association, the, uh, uh, any conservation group in Michigan supports Proposal 1. And if this board supports Proposal 1, uh, I'll push forward a, a, a resolution to the county board for them to consider supporting Proposal 1. Be right I've also read it and uh, been looking at it too, and I think it's something that, that we ought to do is uh, get a motion to support Proposal 1. Is that, is that the best? Oh, maybe Yarbrough, is that what you suggest, Brian? Is that the best thing for us to do? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do, you have, do you have a motion yet? Not yet. We're waiting for you. I make a motion that we support proposal one. This is James Bednar. I second the motion. Yeah, that the Berrien County Parks and Recreation Board. Okay, roll call vote. Richard Schinkel? Yes. Jamie Poit? Aye. Carl Kiefer? Yes. Amy Yarborough? Yes. Christopher Quatrin? Yes. Bill Chickering? Oh, he stepped away for a second. He's not at his computer right now. <laughs> Tony Corkin? Yes. James Bendar? Yes. That's it. Good. He, didn't, he didn't come back. <laughs> so. Good. Uh, motion is passed. I think the next slide is J.B. Hoyt. Is that? Your business? No, he was, no. Oh. Do you have another PowerPoint? Yeah, it's the other PowerPoint. Oh, that's in the S drive? Oh, I'm sorry, I did not know that. Hold on. Okay, I, 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 I was it. just going to share my screen. Oh, you got it? I can do that. Perfect. Um, and I want to thank uh, Dick and Brian for the support in, in talking about this today. As you all know, we, in August of last year, uh, made a motion to move our parks millage from the 0.1 mill currently to 0.2 mills, which is well within the uh, existing authority. Uh, the county commission did not address that until December, at which point it was too late to get it on the 2020 tax rolls. I think it's imperative to support the many things we're talking about and the challenges we see with erosion and uh, failing infrastructure, et cetera, to move forward with this effort at this time. And therefore, I, I'm uh, got the following presentation to share with you all, um, except it's not doing it. Hang on, sorry, folks. <laughs> this worked in my last presentation. I apologize. Can you go over yours then? I can try to go in there and then. With all your back, what do you think? Well, and that's pulling it up. Let me uh, thank you, Annette. Uh, let me keep uh, talking about this a little bit. What this presentation is, is a, is a presentation I'd like to see every one of us sit down with our county commissioners, the ones in our district, and walk them through the importance of this material. Um, and seek their support for this promptly so that we can have, uh, have the board, the county commission, I should say, approve this in time to get on the 2021 tax rolls. And so, uh, Mamie, uh, you're getting this early, and, and uh, Bill, if he comes back, we'll get it early as well. Uh, 
you know, we've, we've, we talk about a lot of things that parks are doing and Derek really emphasized some of this when he talked about the turnout at Love Creek this year. Um, the fact that we impact health and wellness, economic development, uh, employee attraction and retention. One of our biggest uh, private donors to parks is, is a leader in a local business who feels strongly about the value of parks. Um, youth education development, again, we saw examples of that. So parks impact a lot of things that are important to this community. Um, next slide, please, Annette. Um, when the current millage was put in place, we had two parks. Actually, I think we had four. We had four parks at the time. Now we have seven parks. Uh, parks use was increasing prior to the pandemic. It certainly accelerated since then. Uh, as the, you saw the proposal from Brian a moment ago on, on uh, uh, proposal one, that will increase the amount of grant monies available, or that will increase the amount of monies available in the trust fund. We'll need budget to be able to grant, match those grant monies. Uh, the interest in our linear parks is substantial. Uh, the, the plan that we've got in our, uh, our five-year master plan. As we've talked at some length in these meetings, our infrastructure is aging. There's a list of several of those. Actually, when you get the revised presentation from me, you'll see there's, there's uh, even more issues on that list. And so the, the funding is, is vital if we're going to continue to meet our mission in Berrien County Parks. Uh, next slide, please. I did a look at some of the other millages within Berrien County. Our millage is a fraction of other things. Obviously, law enforcement and 911 are pretty vital functions. Uh, I'm not belittling senior centers. I technically qualify as one of those myself. But senior centers are getting three times the millage that we're getting in parks. And I would venture to say more people use our parks than use our senior centers. As I looked at other communities around the state, this is a sample from, from uh, various websites that I was able to glean. Uh, they range anywhere from uh, 0.2 mils up to uh, 0.5 mils across the state. Uh, again, substantially more than, than we're doing here in Berrien County. So we are uh, really uncompetitive, even though we have a great parks network. Our, our support for those parks is not competitive. Uh, next slide, please. And, and the impact of this is, is modest, as I said. Uh, to move from a 0.1 mil to 0.2 mils within the existing authorization, so it's not require a vote of the people. It does require uh, maybe a vote, vote of you and your fellow commissioners. The impact on the average property owner in Berrien County is $9 a year. Mm. We all recognize this is, a, this is a tough time economically for a lot of folks, but very honestly, $9 is a pretty de minimis amount to support the parks that, that we've built and need to be able to maintain and, 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 and keep them in place. So uh, that's the proposal. Uh, if this group is willing, I'd like to have each of us meet with county commissioners that are the ones that are in our district. Um, Yes, even meet with maybe again and twist her arm some more if we can and, and Bill if he's around. Um, because I think this is vital for the success of Berrien County Parks. If we cannot meet our mission without funding to do the very things we've been talking about. And so I appreciate your support and would entertain any questions. All right, JB, this is Jim Bednar. Are you going to send this file to everybody? Yeah, I've, I've got a slightly, thank you, Jim. I've got a slightly updated version of this uh, that I was hoping to share. Uh, and I will get that to Sue and have her send that out to each of you. So you'll have a, a, a version of this you can work with yourselves. JB, Mimi Yarbrough, I would like to ask, are you asking that this be uh, instituted by the Barron County Commission? Or are you asking that it be put on the ballot for the vote of the people? No, this does not require a vote of the people. The people have already authorized you as county commissioners to do a tax of up to 0.25 mils in support of county parks. We are currently only levying 0.1 mil. And this proposal would take it to 0.2, which is well within our existing authorization. So it's something that you can do as a commissioner. Uh, and I see Bill's just joined us just in time. Uh, you, you guys can do as commissioners that uh, do not require a vote of the people. We know that. Uh, that's how we did the one because for a number of years we did not have it. We haven't had it long, have we? Uh, 2009, I believe. Hello, I believe we've had it since 2009. 
Commissioner Tickering? Um, to that question, I don't know. I apologize. I was talking to uh, Administrator Gisette about going down to several minutes. Um, if JB is asking the question about increasing the millage, uh, yeah, well, this, is early the, as a this, this is the action we took as a part. Is that the question? In August of last year. Uh, to, Correct. And to, what, and what to, happened? And I, I'm sure you all heard the story that uh, the full county commission, contrary to rec recommendations from myself and Commissioner Yarborough and others, the full county commission said, no, we are not going to do that. So that's what happened. Uh, I recognize that, Bill. And, uh, and again, I think that was done without a deep understanding on the part of some of your fellow commissioners, obviously you and Mamie who've been in these meetings understand the situation. And so the part that you missed of this is this presentation is gonna go out to each of the, the uh, parks commission members to ask them to meet with your peers on the county commission to individually carry them through this and really emphasize the need for parks so that it can be reconsidered with, with greater information. I don't think anybody is gonna raise tax is in the code, JB, period. Bill, I respect your point of view. Um, as, as you well know, the, the, the impact of this is de minimis. It's $9 per household on average. And as you also know, our county parks are deteriorating. We cannot meet our mission without more funding. So I think we have to go back to, to seek your support again. And you know, if, if it fails, we will have to trim things out of budget. We will have to close facilities or close parts of facilities because we just can't keep open things that are falling apart. That's a tough decision. That's why it needs to go to you guys. Brian. Commissioner, this is Brian Bailey. Um, and, and Commissioner Chickering was in our budget hearing and kind of sidetracking what JB, we know there's some big uh, ticket items coming at us full steam ahead in the next, well, the erosion is coming at us right now. A quarter million dollar playground at Silver Beach is at the end of its life. A half million dollar concession stand proposal to bring in additional revenues is something that we're also looking at. This doesn't include any of the number of projects at Love Creek at uh, restrooms for Galeen River, restrooms for Pawpaw River, uh, Madeline Bird Trans infrastructure needs. We just see what's happening in that Silver Beach County Park. The discussion was, look at the millage. The other alternative that I'm going to bring forward to the County Board and the County Parks Commission is developing and kindling our public-private partnerships. And one of those homework duties that I'm doing is we've had 150 events at Silver Beach, plus or minus events where alcohol was served at appropriate events. I think we need to keep kindling that idea. We had a one day event at Love Creek County Park in October last year that brought in almost $10,000 for a bicycle event where beer and wine was served. I see two, three ideas really, is we look at the millage increase, we look at private public partnership development and keep going down that path. And the third option that I don't think is acceptable to anybody in this meeting is to do nothing. And if you have a third or fourth option that we can bring in a substantial amount of resources to help with our infrastructure needs, we're all ears. Well, Any other comments, Dick? Well, I, the, the, or the looking at my situation, I have a home on 60 acres with a stream, and my taxes 
for the price was $14. And I can't get into a theater for $14 of my life. So even though it's, it's minimal and it is, yes, raising taxes, but it's, it's not that dramatic. And I think my wife and I were talking about this coming here today. I think we're probably one of the to top three, or maybe top five features in Barry County that is, they're basically good for the development of the county. I mean, tourism, food, or, or, or education, and so on are, are important, but this accents all of it, as the DB has already pointed out. So it, it, we, we, it pays for us to maintain and increase our parks and make them keep, I should say, keep them the wonderful parks that they are today. Mr. Chipper. He's got to unmute. He doesn't know he's not muted. Hold on. Unmute. Can we talk to him? Right, there we go. There we there go. go. There there go. go. I, Sorry, guys. I have, to, have to, leave, to leave this meeting. I'm meeting administrator just set in 10 minutes. So um, great discussion about taxes. Let's continue that in my light. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, you were still going? I'm oh, sorry. Oh. I, got, I got out of it. I thought we were done. Oh. I'll go back. Hang on. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm not going to go back and share my screen. Oops. Okay. Hold on. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. <laughs> Hey, Brian. Yes. Go. My understanding, uh, Tony Corkin, my understanding is that uh, we'll be receiving uh, information uh, in the mail uh, relative to the uh, increase. Well, we can either email it to you, Tony, or we can uh, uh, U.S. Postal Service to you, uh, J.B. Hoyt's presentation. You'll be getting it one way or the other. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, the other question I have is that uh, with the increase, how much money would that bring in? Has that been calculated? Uh, bring in roughly $400,000, give or take, Tony, three hundred fifty dollars to $400,000 per year. No, it would double, wouldn't it? Yeah, oh, no, no, yeah, you're right, you're right. If it, I'm sorry, Tony, it would bring about $750,000 per you? year. Yes. All right. Yeah, is there, is there, and another question, has there been ever an, uh, an increase uh, since the inception of this, uh, this millage? No. You know, there's been... let, me, let me take a crack at that for you, if I might. Tony, that's a, that's a slide that you didn't see that's, that I will have in the, in the revised deck. Okay. And, and it shows that prior to the implementation of the millage we had about a four hundred thousand dollar allocation from the county every year the millage as brian just said brings in about seven hundred thousand today this would double that but of that seven hundred thousand today we spend roughly a hundred thousand dollars a year on the 1839 courthouse that we didn't have mm -hmm. prior to the millage we're also now uh, <laughs> other departments of the county are because we have our own millage we're picking up some of the administrative costs that spread across the county. That's another $180,000 round figures. Therefore, our budget today with seven county parks is only about $450,000 uh, versus $400,000 11 years ago. It's essentially mm -hmm. no increase. Now, the other, another aspect of this, uh, I'm not so sure we've ever had the opportunity to uh, measure the economic impact on Berrien County with the parks that we have, in particular as we've improved the numbers that we've had. I, I don't know whether you can substantiate that or not. Okay, uh, I think that can be done, Tony. We did it years back 
but the other thing I think that, that some of the commissioners are missing, these things are going to be forced upon us at some time or other. And right now, none of the county general fund is taking any, we're not taking any money from the general fund. Well, before this millage, we were taking seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars from them. So, you know, they, they lose back of that, uh, that revenue of money that we have saved them by this tiny millage. And they will be forced upon us. If we, you know, the, the shoreline thing is not something that's going to go away. And it's not going to be cheap. And it will be forced upon us one way or another. And the, court, the county may have to carve up some money. And that's just one thing. Brandon? I have a question. I have a quick question, JV. Um, or JV. Uh, is this a vote by the Board of Commissioners for the increase of the millage, or do we put it on the ballot? No, of course, as I said. By, it's a vote by the county commissioners only. It, well, it needs, no, needs no public approval. They can do it by themselves. No, maybe they have done it. Well, maybe we want maybe. to put it on the ballot and let the voters of Barron County decide. You know, how important they're, they're, uh, they part did last, we they did last year. They, they did that last year and they said no. We asked them for point two instead of point one. And they said no. But we're coming back to them again and we'd like to ask reconsider. Yeah, again, I did. It's, 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 as JV pointed out, right now we're the lowest assessed millage out there. And where I think, as he indicated, we're a whole lot more usage than the senior citizens, even though they're very, very important to us, and some of these other things. I would. Our, I would our park system are underrated for what they, they how they influence the county. Uh, I would also add to that, Dick, if I might, that uh, Chris, in response to your question, the voters have already authorized a millage up to 0.25. We're just not levying at all. All we're doing is asking the commissioners to levy more of what the voters have previously authorized. So how did it get to a vote then? How did it was put on a ballot? I don't remember it on the ballot. Oh, the county commissioners are the only ones who vote on it. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is why don't we take it to the citizens of Barron County and let them vote on it? The citizens? What I, what I, yeah, you're on the ballot. The citizens, the citizens, it would only be an advisory vote. No, you, I think you'd be surprised at how many people in Barron County really like our parks or are willing to help fund it. You know, I, I think you'd probably be surprised. So well, you're asking to do an advisory vote. Easy. It's, it's Commissioner um, Quadrant. It's too late to get it on the uh, November 2020 ballot, um, in my opinion. For, yeah. for uh, PA, PA 90, Act PA 90 allows the County Board of Supervisors, County Board of Commissioners, to enact a tax uh, up to 0.25%. And that's what the County Board did in 2012. And it's been on a renewal every four years since. Um, so it's been renewed a couple times. Um, I think what you're asking for, Commissioner Quatrin, is, is uh, PA 90 would go away and a, uh, it'd be under a different millage um, that would be voted on by the public. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't blame any of the Board of Commissioners not wanting to raise taxes. That's that's very difficult to do. You know, yeah. It, it, yeah, they'll get a lot of calls. I mean, you got to remember, I'm in an office that I assess homeowners. I know what that's like, you know. And if, if, we went, I, if we went to Millie, I'm sorry, if we went with the Millie draw to the citizens of Bay County, it would be expensive because you would have to have a vote for that by itself. And this way, there's no money expended except yes or no by each county commissioner. Yeah, I'm going to say, I think it's going to be a hard sell to the Board of Commissioners. I really do. Maybe. 
Maybe she wants to talk to me. She's there. She's on mute. Yeah. We, I there said, all, the approval is already there for 0.25. If we chose to put it on a ballot, would we need to raise it to 0.3 or something? Something higher than what we already have? It's already been granted. Um, JB, do you think about that, that if it was on a ballot, and my thought, a ballot is when there is an election. If you did one just on that, it would cost. You know, that would, uh, th that is an option, I suppose. No, I've not given much consideration. It would not solve our problem because it would not be effective until, uh, until sometime in the future. We're asking for action that would make it effective for our budget in 2021, not 23 or some future year. This is Jim Bednar. I'm still trying to clarify this a bit because I wasn't on the board back when all this passed. Uh, but my understanding then, really the voters have approved it for whatever, 0.25 mil, we're getting 0.1, no other funds from the county. Is the county commissioners really understand that there's some liability for all the erosion and what it would do to the streets. And if they don't want it, there's no money really to deal with it in the grander scale, the bigger scale, having read the stuff that came for the, thousand three thousand dollars a foot linear foot to try to do all the way um do they have an idea that maybe by avoiding a little bit of money now might avoid some liability and lawsuits down the road if the road caves in and stuff i don't i don't know that roads would be uh in parks and recreation roads would be in the road department i imagine right but I'm looking to take it from parks and rec brian bailey help me or oh, brian does that you're there, aren't you? No, he stepped out, Commissioner. Brian um, Bailey, uh, fixing the road, uh, we would look for other money, wouldn't we? Uh, no. You could not use PA, not, you could not use the Parks Village to fix roads. Right. It's, it's right. A, it comes from. Right. right. I guess I'm just saying Somewhere maybe else. they don't, pardon me, Jim Bednar again, that maybe they don't realize that there could be some. You're saving money by putting some investment in to shore up the erosion now that will be a bigger expense if someone's going to have to bear another department down the road. Maybe they don't quite see it that way, but it's a point that might carry. Jim, this is one of the reasons, I think all of us are, are, are bringing out a number of good ideas. And I think it's important that when we, that we talk to our county commissioners one-on-one -on -one, or there's time for this kind of interaction and making those points and having that kind of discussion. Uh, the problem with trying to do things in a, in a commission meeting, with all due respect to the commissioners, is they've got a huge amount of agenda to cover in a short period of time. So the, I really feel our job as parks commissioners is to give them the ammunition they need to go into that meeting and vote yes. So, Jim Benner, so JB, what kind of a time frame are you looking at to try to approach the commissioners? Uh, this thing will have to pass in early November. So... I would say between now and the end of October, uh, because it has to be on their ballot or their on their agenda, I should say, in uh, either November the seventh or November the fourteenth. Thanks. One of the things I'm not sure when when does the tax see the tax uh, the tax bills go out, and I'm not sure the date. I thought it was sometime in November. They go out. I'd have to ask the treasurer. Yeah, because it's December one. I'm Some sorry. Of them do now on the taxes, aren't they? Yeah, but this tax bill for the the winter taxes are going out. So this would be on the summer taxes. The idea, Christopher, is to get this on the winter taxes. Okay. Uh, that's why it has to be voted on in early November to allow time for those bills to be properly prepared. Okay, I thought we were getting. Yeah, the window is very tight. That's why I was. I, I, I concur. And, you know, frankly, I'll leave it to uh, Administrator DeSette to figure out what the exact timing of that is and how that best fits on the, the board's agenda in order to make it, uh, make it in the time frame necessary. I think our action is promptly. We're going to have to move along because we have to be out of here pretty quick. Uh, as we're talking about the 2021 budget for capital improvements that are, are currently funded, whether in the uh, parks budget, 
is uh, Love Creek, meaning a water filtration system. Th that water filtration system will be 20 years old and it's really held together with safety pins and duct tape and it's about $4,000 estimates to get that replaced. Um, we know we have our acquisition grant. We applied for 300,000 to be matched with 100,000. That money is earmarked in our parks budget. Uh, our zero turn mower for system wide will be uh, six years old. We're generally on a five year rotation. So we'll uh, replace that mower. And our Silver Beach Surf Rate, the beach cleaner, is used five, six, seven days a week. It was purchased in 1993. It was refurbished in 2010. Since the refurbishing in 2021, it would be, uh, be a, uh, 11 years old from the refurbishing, but it is nearing a 30 year old piece of equipment that is vital. So that's a 55,000. So all those four capital improvements are on our list for 2021. Just a FYI. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Brian, Tony Corgan. Yes, Tony. Uh, the millage for the parks. Uh, what's the amount of money that comes in uh, that, that generates for you? One more time. How much money does the current millage generate each year? Ballpark, roughly $750,000. 650000 7507 Okay. But you have to subtract the courthouse yeah. and the um, indirect costs. Thank you. Yes. Next slide. Is that it? I wasn't sure. I will try to go. Yep. Oh, I think it. So <laughs> next meeting. Next meeting. Okay. Um, so that's the way things are now. I think we're going to leave the next meeting date up to uh, whatever is needed when Brian can call one. But I do need a motion to adjourn. I so move. Oh, this is Carl. Did you have to have those right? Report. Oh. Tony, you roll, roll call, you think? Pardon? You want a roll call? No, no, I'm sorry. I don't, I have to check the public comments. Oh, right? we normally do at the beginning, but was there public comments? Yeah, so, the, so there's not, but I just wanted to okay. go on the record. Yes. We have checked the public comments. Yeah, 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 and yes. Yeah, and there are no, there are no. So we're good. <laughs> I just want to make right. sure. Tony correct. made a motion to adjourn. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, motion second. Yes. This is Carl. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Carry. Thank you. Hey, thanks for everybody coming. I appreciate seeing all of you. <laughs> Well, maybe next time we can meet in person. I hope so. Yeah, nice.